Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 was just minutes from landing in Amsterdam when something went wrong. Fast. The weather was clear, the runway in sight, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. But within seconds, the plane hit the ground, short of the runway, breaking into pieces. What caused this unexpected crash shook trust in Boeing and raised questions that still haunt the industry today. So, what went wrong? And why did this incident spark major changes inside Boeing? In this video, we'll break down what caused the crash, how Boeing responded, and why this moment became a turning point for the aviation industry. Turkish Airlines, Flight 1951, departed Istanbul Atatürk Airport early on the morning of February 25, 2009, bound for Amsterdam. The Boeing 737-800 was a well-maintained seven-year-old aircraft. It carried 128 passengers and seven crew members, including the highly experienced Captain Hasan Tasin Arizan, former Turkish Air Force Phantom II pilot with over 5,000 fighter hours, instructor and safety pilot Olgay Özgür, and line training co-pilot Murat Caesar. The flight towards Schiphol proceeded normally across European airspace. As Flight 1951 neared Amsterdam, it was cleared for an instrument landing system approach to runway 18R also known as the Polderbahn. This runway lies in reclaimed Polderland roughly 1.5 kilometers north of the threshold, bordered by the busy A9 motorway. On this morning, weather conditions were remarkable. Light winds, good visibility, and scattered clouds ideal for approach. Yet beneath that calm sky lurked an overlooked threat. The crew configured for landing well before approaching the glide path. They lowered flaps and landing gear, set target speeds, and prepared for what should have been a routine descent. However, due to a procedural oversight, they engaged the autopilot in single-channel mode, CMDA only, instead of dual-channel as per Turkish Airlines SOP. Unbeknownst to them, the captain's side radio altimeter had malfunctioned earlier, already glitching twice during the flight without triggering major concern. Routine conversations between the pilots revealed awareness of slight instrument irregularities, but they did not suspend the approach. Air traffic control vectored the aircraft onto heading 265 degrees and instructed descent to 2,000 feet while they were already above the glide slope. That tight vectoring increased crew workload, pulling attention toward checklist items and communications rather than cross-checking instrument data. By the time the aircraft descended below 2,000 feet, and captured the ILS glide path, the autopilot was managing pitch, and the autothrottle, expecting imminent touchdown, began its retard on short final function. This sequence is standard, but here, faulty altimeter input would have fatal results. Everything looked normal, flaps at 15 degrees, landing gear down, airspeed around 195 knots. In the cockpit, voices stayed calm and professional, unaware of a critical threshold rapidly approaching just out of sight. In clear morning sunlight, with the runway visible ahead, Flight 1951 seemed on track. But instruments and systems were already working on flawed data. Just minutes before impact, something quietly but catastrophically went wrong inside the cockpit of Flight 1951. The captain's radio altimeter, a critical sensor used during final approach, started feeding the aircraft a dangerous lie. It told the autopilot the plane was already on the ground. Specifically, it read minus eight feet. That number doesn't just mean a glitch. It tells the aircraft systems, we've already landed. Meanwhile, the co-pilot's altimeter was working just fine. It correctly displayed that the aircraft was still hundreds of feet above ground. But the auto throttle system on this Boeing 737-800 wasn't designed to double check both altimeters. It trusted only the captain's side for landing decisions. And with that minus eight reading, the autothrottle did what it was programmed to do. It pulled the engines to idle, as if the plane had touched down. That quiet pullback of thrust happened at around 1,950 feet, far too early. But it didn't trigger immediate panic. In fact, things looked deceptively normal. The engines went quiet, but the aircraft continued descending smoothly. Inside the cockpit, there were no alarms no flashing red lights, just a silent, deadly drop in speed that would only become obvious too late. Then came the warning chime. Too low, gear. But this wasn't a call for action. It was misleading. The gear was already down. The warning was being triggered by the same faulty altimeter. 
These automated alerts, instead of helping the pilots focus on the real problem, became a source of distraction. The crew might have interpreted the call as a minor nuisance or thought it was related to terrain, not realizing it stemmed from a critical system misread. Here's the chilling part. This exact altimeter fault had shown up before. Multiple Boeing 737 operators had logged incidents where the radio altimeter read zero or negative values while still airborne. In some of those cases, the auto throttle also prematurely reduced engine thrust, but none of those prior incidents ended in disaster, usually because the flight crews caught the drop in speed and disengaged the auto throttle in time. In fact, Turkish Airlines experienced a similar glitch just two weeks before on another 737 during their approach to Istanbul. No one was hurt then, and the issue was logged, but it wasn't flagged as urgent. Boeing knew about the anomaly. Pilots had reported it. But the manufacturer hadn't issued a mandatory fix. There was a bulletin acknowledging the problem, but no enforced software update. It was a ticking time bomb hidden in routine data logs. Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 came down just 1.5 kilometers short of runway 18R at Schiphol, crashing into a muddy field near the village of Zwanenberg. The wreckage was devastating. The tail slammed into the ground first, followed by the fuselage and then the nose. The aircraft split into three large sections. The cockpit was torn completely off. Despite the destruction, there was one unexpected factor that helped. There was no fire. That single detail likely saved dozens of lives. In total, nine people died. Among them were all three pilots in the cockpit, Captain Hassan Tassin Arizin, First Officer Murat Caesar, and safety pilot Olgay Özgür. The other six fatalities were passengers seated in the forward rows. The rest of the 128 passengers and four cabin crew survived, though over 80 people were injured, some critically. Emergency responders arrived quickly and the rescue efforts began. And as first responders stabilized survivors and evacuated the scene, attention turned to the cause, the black boxes, flight data recorder, or FDR, and cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, were recovered intact and sent to the Bureau d'Enquête et d'Analyse, or BEA, in Paris for decoding. Leading the official investigation was the Dutch Safety Board, with full cooperation from Turkish authorities. Boeing and the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board also joined the inquiry, as did the FAA. From the start, there were complications. Dutch and American investigators clashed on how to interpret pilot actions versus system behavior. Boeing sent technical advisors to explain the logic of the 737's auto throttle and how the aircraft relied on the captain's radio altimeter for final approach automation. Meanwhile, Turkish Airlines provided internal maintenance logs and crew duty schedules. The flight crew had been well-rested and experienced. So, fatigue was not a factor. By May 2009, the DSB released a preliminary report. It confirmed that the left radio altimeter had malfunctioned and that the autothrottle had used this faulty data to reduce engine power far too early. The final report, published in 2010, pointed to both design issues and human oversight. Boeing's decision to let the auto throttle rely solely on a single altimeter without cross-verification was heavily scrutinized, leading to real reforms in aviation and changes in its aircrafts. In the months following the crash of Flight 1951, Boeing moved quickly, but not publicly, to issue a critical safety notice to all operators of the 737 Next Generation and BBJ series. This maintenance operations manual bulletin told airlines to be extra cautious, monitor radio altimeter readings closely, and avoid using autopilot or autothrottle if those readings appeared inaccurate. It wasn't mandatory, but it was serious, especially since Boeing already knew that single altimeter dependency could lead to engine thrust rollback on approach. The bulletin didn't go far enough to force changes. Airlines were expected to train crews to watch for faulty readings, but it wasn't until five years later, in 2014, that the FAA finally stepped in with a firm software mandate. Boeing had to redesign the auto throttle logic across the 737NG fleet so it would no longer rely on just the captain's radio altimeter. Instead, it would check both units and avoid reducing power if they disagreed. It was a change that could have prevented the Turkish Airlines crash had it existed in 2009. 
The crash of Flight 1951 led to real reforms, improving training protocols, clearer automation override procedures, and better diagnostic tools for radio altimeter mismatches, making flight descents much safer today. So, what's your take on this? Should more have been done earlier, or was this the wake-up call the industry needed? Drop your thoughts in the comments, give this video a like if you found it eye-opening, and don't forget to subscribe for more stories like this. That's all from this video, see you in the next one.